Welcome everybody to, um, I guess it's technically the third day, but day two of, of NUG 2014. We'll start off today with um, Nurse Director Sudeep Dosanjh. Um, Sudeep, as I said, is, is Director of Nurse. Previously, he headed Extreme Scale Computing at Sandia National Laboratories and was co-director of Los Angeles Sandia Alliance for Computing at the Extreme Los Scale. Los Los Angeles. <laughs> what is it? Los Angeles. Extreme Scale from 2008 to 2012. He also served on the U.S. Department of Energy's Exascale Initiative Steering Committee for several years. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Richard. And I, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I was uh, uh, heading back from D.C. last night, and uh, my, my flight got canceled. And I told him, well, I've got to make it back, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> So I was happy to get on another flight. I was crunched in the middle seat for uh, about six hours, but I was happy to, happy to arrive here in time to, uh, to, to make it here and, and meet all of you. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, this is a very special meeting for us. Uh, uh, this is kind of the kickoff, uh, as you've heard, uh, of our uh, 40th year, our, uh, our anniversary. And we do have uh, some faces from the past who've, uh, who've joined us. So uh, Michael McCoy is here. And he was uh, heavily involved with, with NERSC at Livermore when it first started. And you were the deputy director for a while? At the end. At the end, okay. And then, uh, I'm, where's Bill Kramer? Did Bill st step out? So Bill Kramer is here. And, and, uh, and so he certainly has a very long history with NERSC as well when, once it was at, at Berkeley. So, so, uh, so we'll have some... Oh, okay, okay. Okay. No, we, yeah, we appreciate everyone coming out, and I guess we'll have some reminiscences. reminiscences uh. After lunch, we will have a lineup of all the quote-unquote old codgers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was telling uh, Michael that uh, I've been director of nurse for about 15 months, so I can't take much credit for the 40 years. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is pretty amazing that, that uh, 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 because I still remember uh, nurse when it was first, first getting started. So... So I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of kind of where we're at with NERSC and uh, where we're headed over the next, uh, uh, over the next, uh, the next decade. And so as I mentioned, you know, we, NERSC was established uh, originally at Livermore in 1974. So, so 2014, we're right at, right at 40 years. Uh, it had a long history. A lot happened while it was at Livermore in in uh, 96, it moved to, uh, to Berkeley Lab. Uh, There's also a name change, uh, became the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. Um, a lot of our, if you notice, these are just kind of highlights, but, but one of the notable things that was going on while NERSC moved to, uh, to Berkeley was the transition from vector supercomputers to massively parallel computers, and that was actually a very, very challenging time for a lot of the users uh, at NERSC. Um, certainly we have lots of, even back then, there were lots and lots of users and lots of codes. And managing that transition, that was actually a, you know, a very major transition for the, for the community, uh, was, was definitely a challenge. Uh, and, and in some ways, we're facing kind of a similar challenge now as we go to multi-core. Uh, we have, again, we have lots of users, and so we can't, perhaps make a very radical shift, but we recognize that we need to start making a shift with our next generation systems. And so, so we do like, liken kind of the, you know, kind of what's going on now with the move to multi-core and perhaps a new programming model and, and the, the changes that are going to be required in the software to what we had uh, successfully managed back in the, the late 90s. And of course, there were lots of lessons learned from back then as well um, that, that we're, we can apply to now. Another kind of major shift that's been happening is uh, uh, over the last uh, decade or, or even longer has been really a growing emphasis on data. And so if you see a lot of the, the, the highlights over the last uh, 18 years or so, we, had, we established PDSF, which is a data intensive computing system for nuclear and high energy physics. And you certainly heard some highlights and you're going to hear a talk later on that talks about some of the some of the insights that have been gained from that. Uh, HPSS became the mass storage system platform in 99. We deployed a facility-wide file system in 2006. 
uh, and we started a collaboration with the Joint Genome Institute. So we provide all the computing for JGI. And so, so I'll talk more about this, but there's been, you know, there's lots of talk about big data, but we deal with lots of big data at NERSC as well. It's more scientific data, so it's, uh, it's not uh, the type of data that Google de deals with, but it's still very large quantities of data that we're, uh, we're dealing with now. So we do uh, collaborate with computer companies to deploy advanced uh, HPC and data resources. Uh, um, I was at, uh, as uh, Richard mentioned, I was at uh, Los Al with uh, Sandia and Los Alamos working on Cielo at the same time NERSC was working on Hopper. And those were sister systems that were deployed at the same time. They were the first Cray petascale systems with a Gemini interconnect. Uh, right now, we have, uh, we have accepted and we're going to have a dedication later on uh, for Edison. And that's the first Cray petascale system with Intel processors, Ares, Interconnect, and Dragonfly topology. It was the serial number one system for the uh, HPCS program. Um, uh, right now, we're working with, with ACES again. Uh, they're going to deploy Trinity in the 2015-2016 timeframe. And we'll be deploying a sister, sister system, NERSC aid. And, uh, uh, and those are being jointly designed as on-ramps to Exascale. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then we've architected and deployed data platforms, including the largest uh, DOE system focused on genomics. Uh, so with all of these, you know, these are leading edge systems. There's always lots of challenges when you're deploying systems like this. Uh, 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 you can't buy these things out of a catalog. Uh, it always requires very close collaboration with the computer companies and with the technology providers to, to deploy these systems. There are always hiccups. I don't know of a single system that's been ever deployed if the, at this kind of scale that doesn't have some, some hiccups. So part of our strategy, which I'll talk a little bit more about, has been always to have two large computational systems uh, on the floor at the same time so that, that one is always stable. Uh, and when we bring the new one in, uh, uh, there's always one that, that has a, a five-year window uh, that's kind of in the middle of its life cycle as we're deploying the new one. And so that's a little bit, that's probably something that's a little bit different that we do. Um, uh, it's a, driven by the very large numbers of, uh, of users that we have and, and the need to provide a stable computing uh, platform. So the other result of all of this is we really employ experts in high performance computing, computer systems engineering. These are, this really takes a lot of specialized expertise to deploy these very large, uh, very large systems. So one thing that's uh, different about NERSC as opposed to the other computing centers within Office of Science is that we are actually the primary computing facility for DOE's Office of Science. So we, we provide mission computing for, for Office of Science. And, and, uh, the pie chart on the right shows the, the six different offices within Office of Science and uh, uh, how much usage each of them has at, at NERSC. Uh, one result is that DOE's uh, program managers actually allocate the majority of computing and storage resources at NERSC. Uh, so the six program offices allocate their base allocation, so we make a projection of, of based on what they had last year, and they, they allocate their base and then they submit proposals for over-target. So, and then the deputy director of science actually prioritizes these over-target requests. So, so we directly support Office of Science's uh, uh, mission. Each of the centers also has a 10% director's reserve, but 90% but, uh, uh, of our, our resources really get allocated uh, th through the nurse program. The other point is that, that our usage really shifts, uh, so you know, we, we, we can't pick our users. You know, we have to uh, serve the people uh, who are selected as users. And then the usage really shifts as DOE priorities change. So if you, ch if you see changes in DOE strategic plan, that directly affects uh, uh, the, the, the problems that are run at NERSC. And so if you look at the changes from 2002 to 2012, uh, one thing that we noticed was that there's, so in blue is 2012 and in red is in 2002. And what you'll see are increases in things like material science, chemistry, uh, climate research, biosciences, earth sciences. So there's been an increase in 
relative usage for science that has an application. And so I think that's been kind of a deliberate shift within the Office of Science, and you see that reflected uh, in the usage at NERSC as well. We really focus on the, the scientific impact of our users. Uh, uh, so this is, you know, this is uh, really bragging about all of you. It's, uh, so it's, it's easier to do. I was have a hard time uh, bragging about what we're doing, but this is bra bragging about our users. And we, we really enable uh, an amazing breadth of science. We have uh, typically about 1,500 journal publications per year, uh, more than uh, 10 journal cover stories per year. Uh, there were 17 this past year. Um, uh, there were three recent Nobel Prize winning projects that used NERSC. Um, Physics Magazine's 2013 Breakthrough of the Year used NERSC uh, resources to identify the first uh, high energy cosmic neutrinos. Um, finding Earth like uh, planets are not uncommon was uh, recognized by uh, uh, Wired Magazine as a top scientific discovery and covered in the New York Times. MIT researchers developed a new uh, approach for desalinating uh, seawater, and that was one of Smithsonian Magazine's fifth surprising scientific milestone of 2012. Four of Science Magazine's last uh, insights of the last decade, three in genomics and one related to cosmic microwave background, those were all enabled by uh, uh, NERSC resources helped enable those. And so, so, as I mentioned, there were 17 journal covers in, in actually, there were 17 in uh, 2012, and so I asked Harvey, well, how many did we have in 2013? And it turned out uh, that we had 20, uh, the same number in 2013 as well. Uh, we support a very broad user base. Um, uh, we have 4,500 users, and we typically add about 350 a year. I've, uh, uh, I haven't tried it with my new, uh, I just got a new Edison T-shirt, but, but I have a Hopper T-shirt. And now it's kind of falling apart, and so I can't do it anymore. But every time I've gotten on a, an airplane with my Hopper T-shirt, I've had someone approach me saying, "Oh, do you work at NERSC?" And so, uh, so it has always been. Uh, so, so I, I guess uh, maybe that means our users not only do we have a lot of them, but they seem to fly a lot. Um, they're geographically distributed. Uh, we have 47 states. So in in dark blue are states with uh, over 100. So we have. Many states that have over 100 users, there's uh, lots with, with over 50. So it really is a, NERSC really is a national resource. And there's, a, I could have also overlaid laid a, an uh, international map. And so we get lots of users from really all around the world. We have lots of international projects. Uh, uh, and so, so it really is, uh, it, it's amazing to see who's logged on every, uh, every day. So, so one of the consequences of this is that we do have a very, uh, uh, diverse workload. So we have lots of users, but we have over 600 uh, different codes and, and, and algorithms. Um, uh, shown in the upper right are, is kind of the breakdown of the different algorithms. And so the slices are the codes, and overlaid on there are the different algorithms. So you can see that, that uh, lots of people do uh, fusion, pick codes, lattice, QCD, density functional theory, climate, molecular dynamics. Uh, quantum chemistry. So there's lots of different, different uh, applications and algorithms that we need to support. So when we deploy a large-scale resource, all of these things actually have to run very effectively on it. So not only do we have to have lots of different algorithms that run on our systems, uh, but we also have to support a lot of different job sizes. So we have lots of users in red is the job size breakdown on, uh, for large jobs on Hopper. And so we get lots of very large jobs, uh, and then we get lots of jobs that are high volumes of, uh, or ensembles of calculations as well. And so we have to support this wide mix of jobs uh, on our system. So, so you do have to be capable of running at scale, but then we also have to be able to support what we call high throughput computing, these, these massive, massive numbers of, of smaller simulations for statistics or, or ensembles that people need to do. And we want to be able to do that, uh, uh, you know, seamlessly so that, that you don't have to go to a different system uh, just depending on the, the size of the job that you want to run. Uh, you know, our operational priority is providing uh, highly available HPC resources with really uh, exceptional user support. Uh, we try to maintain a very high availability of users. Uh, so so we, we do chart the, the satisfaction rating. Uh, you all have probably gotten an email for me uh, asking you to complete our user surveys, but we do track those very seriously. We look at 
all the issues, if you write down something, you know, someone actually will go and look at it and will we'll try to figure out what's, what's going on. So if you're having issues, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can call directly or email directly, but, but the user survey is actually a very, very uh, useful resource for us in, in figuring out what help you need. Um, we also want to maximize the productivity of our users. We've had some conversations with uh, Dave Goodwin, our program manager, that, that nurse staff has actually been uh, at about the same number of FTEs for a long period of time. And, and during that time, our number of users has grown very dramatically. And so shown on the left is the number of users, uh, and, and, uh, and the, the red line is the users. And you can see this very dramatic increase from 2002 where we were perhaps around 1,000 to close to 5,000 now. And so we've done that with uh, roughly the same number of staff. And so, so uh, one of the keys here is, is keeping the number of tickets per user down. And so, so this is a very important metric for us. So we, we have to have a plan to, if you, if you generate a ticket for us, we, within three days we have to have some kind of plan for trying to resolve that. And, and so if we get really high in the number of tickets per users, and we have more and more users, you can see we can really very easily get dwarfed. Uh, and so keeping this down, and so we, through a lot of hard work, through the user services group, we've been able to get that down, and the systems group as well, as, as, as figuring out how to, how to make the systems more stable. We've been able to get it down from about 3.4 tickets per user down to about 1.2 tickets per user. And so that's a, that's a, that's a, a huge change that's really been necessitated. Uh, necessitated by this dramatic growth in, in the number of users. And so how have we done that? So as I said, you know, we work very hard to make the systems as reliable as possible. We also try to have training, uh, as much training as we can do. We try to have uh, very useful web pages. Uh, people work really hard on those. They understand that if you don't put something in a web page that, that you're going to get a phone call or you're going to get lots of phone calls. And so, so we try very hard to do things that are scalable. And this is going to be some... some this has to be part of our strategy also for moving to multi-core because we have so many users. We have to do things that are scalable. So we can't, we can't uh, we'll have one-off collaborations with users, uh, but we can't obviously have one-to-one -one collaborations with these many users. And so, so we have to, from what we learn as far as transitioning the codes, we have to figure out how do we, how do we get that to a very broad community. So if we look at NERSC today, uh, this is, th these are the, Large systems, we've just, just deployed Edison. We're going to have the dedication for Edison. Uh, and I talked a little bit more about that. We have Hopper. We have a number of uh, production clusters, uh, uh, Viz and Analytics, data transfer nodes, um, all connected by, by very high-speed networking. We have a local scratch on both of our large systems. And then we have a, a global file system as well as, as, well as archival storage. Uh, we just went to a 100 gigabit connection to the outside. Um, so this just shows uh, uh, the large systems within, within Office of Science currently. Uh, as I said, we always have two at the same time, so when we bring on NERSC-8, we'll, uh, we'll have retired Hopper by that time. Uh, and at that time, our, uh, our systems will be NERSC-8 and, uh, and, and Edison. But we really, uh, I was actually at a meeting where we were talking about redefining uh, uh, the LINPAC benchmark, but we really don't focus on the, the top line, the peak, peak flops. We're really focused on scientific productivity and deploying systems that are, that are useful to all of you. And, and what's happening partially is that the, the benchmark that people use, that Lin, the LINPAC, even the developers recognize, that it's becoming more and more divergent from the everyday applications that we see. So we really focus on other things, and one of the things we focus on is is, uh, is memory, having lots of memory per node, lots of memory bandwidth per, per node. More and more, uh, the performance of applications is limited by your, your ability to transfer data, uh, not, not as much as, uh, as your ability to compute. People will say that, that floating point operations are for free. Uh, and that's because you're often just waiting, waiting for, for data to, to arrive. So you may, you're lucky, you know, if you do uh, a calculation, uh, uh, every eight or ten clock cycles, you're probably actually doing pretty well. Uh, so, so, so we've worked very hard to make the, 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 the in collaboration with Cray and Intel, the, the memory bandwidth is uh, 
per, per node is very high. Um, the peak bisection bandwidth of the new interconnect that Cray has deployed, um, uh, the new type of topology is, is very high relative to the amount of compute that you have. So we think it's a very, very, very well-balanced system that will get lots of science done uh, over the next five years. So if you, if you drove up or came up in the shuttle, you probably saw our new, new building and you probably have heard something about it, but, but that's CRT on the top, that's the artist's rendition, and this is uh, a little bit, it's, there's been a, every, every few days you see significant progress, but, but it's looking more and more like a building. It's pretty imposing as you look up. Uh, 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 um, the, the, the big thing for us is that it's gonna give us a lot more space for the systems and a lot more power. And the other thing is that it will bring NERSC back to currently we're in, for those of you who visited us, we're in downtown Oakland. So it will bring us back onto the hill. And so we'll be co-located with uh, the research division and with ESNet. And, and we'll have certainly be much closer to UC Berkeley. So, so there will be a lot, lot of collaborations uh, that this, this will foster. But it will also give us lots of floor space for, for, for NERSC 8 and NERSC 9. Uh, the building is being designed for exceptional energy efficiency, so it's natural air and water cooling. There are no, uh, no chillers. Uh, we're trying to do heat recovery. The, uh, of course, uh, you don't get, I guess we, in California we get cold when it's 50 degrees, but, but uh, we can't do as much of that as obviously if you're in a much colder climate, but, but we are looking at how we do heat recovery. Uh, the, the, the PUE is... Uh, uh, essentially the efficiency of, of running these systems would be uh, less than 1.1, which is very good. And, and it looks like we're, we'll have a beneficial occupancy in, uh, in November of 2014. And so the, the, when, when you come here in, uh, in 2015, uh, the, the building should be complete. And so we're, we have a plan to move the systems um, into the new building. So we're going to try to make it as, as painless as possible for all of you. Uh, you, you can't make a move of the size without some disruption. Uh, uh, we worked very closely with some of the folks from Livermore, actually, who've done uh, some similar moves uh, to understand some of the issues that, that, that we might be facing as we, as we make this change. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to try to replicate all the data at Oakland and move the uh, replicated data. So the storage system should actually see no d downtime at all uh, when, we, when we move them because uh, there will be a copy that's, that's at NERSC. Um, uh, we're going to move the systems in phases. Hopper will stay actually in, in Oakland and will be retired there. But Edison will move and will deploy NERSC-8 uh, in, the, in the, the new building. So Edison, you know, we're trying to keep it down for uh, as little a time as possible. And so, so for the smaller clusters, you know, we can, we can probably do the moves in about two weeks. Uh, you know, we're estimating about two months for, for, uh, for Edison. So we are looking at some alternatives for how we can, we can replace those hours as well. And so that's something we'll be able to talk to you all about uh, uh, sometime in the next few months. So uh, we've been working very hard on, on NERSC-8. Um, uh, you know, Edison, uh, we made a decision not to deploy GPUs. Uh, within Edison, uh, it would have given them, us a much higher peak. Uh, uh, we would have done much better on Linpack, but our, you know, for our majority of our users, it didn't look like uh, all of our users were quite ready for that jump. We do think that in the 2015-2016 timeframe, uh, there's been lots of work done, and we think people are better poised to make the, the leap. We've identified people who we need to work with, uh, and I think it really is necessary to, to and I'll, I'll show some some data on that later. But I think it really is necessary to make this change to to multi-core and, and more energy efficient architectures. So the, the mission need uh, for, um, uh, for NERSCATE is actually, uh, the user's need is much higher, but we established the mission need is at least 10 times hopper on, on a representative set of DOE benchmarks, but, but we're, we would like to get that on real DOE applications. Uh, we do need to provide very high bandwidth access to existing data. There's lots of data already stored here. And so, so, uh, so NERSCATE needs to integrate w within that environment very seamlessly. Uh, and I said, it, as I said, we need to have a plan to begin transitioning our user base. Um, so this should actually not say not yet known. It's just not public. 
Uh, so we're hoping we'll be able to announce this. We have an independent project review uh, later this month. And so our, our hope is this was a joint project with uh, uh, Los Alamos and Sandia on Trinity. So it doesn't really make sense for one of us to announce it because everyone will know <laughs> what the other system is. And so, so we're going to try to do a joint announcement uh, hopefully in early March. And it looks like we're on track for that. Uh, so, so at one of the one of the telecons uh, uh, in March or April, we'll certainly give you all a lot more detail about what what we can say about NurseGate. It's still uh, going to be uh, an early announcement of the technology, and so we need to work with the technology providers well to figure out exactly what we uh, what we can say. But I think it'll be evident. I mean, I think people will understand what what changes that that need to be made uh, to, to begin preparing for, for NurseGate. Uh, and really, no matter what the technology is, uh, there's a lot of similarity in all the systems. And, and really, multiple levels of code modification may be necessary. You'll need to expose more on-node parallelism, uh, increase application vectorization. Uh, uh, if there was a coprocessor architecture, then you have to worry about locality uh, directives. If there's some local uh, uh, scratch or scratch pad, then, then uh, it's something you'd have to look at as far as how do you most effectively use that. Can the, can the compiler just make use of that, or do we need to add code directives to be able to effectively use that? So this is something that we'll be, we'll be as I said, we'll be talking to you more about. Uh, this just shows notionally um, what we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at a system that, in terms of system peak, would be 20 to 40. Uh, petaflops. The system mem memory would be uh, uh, around a petabyte. A lot of this depends on, there are also lots of budget, uh, lots of options in the contract. So, so part, part of this is to be a little bit fuzzy on what the system is, uh, but part of it is also that there are, there are options uh, to, to make, make changes because, again, this is still early, and so, so we don't uh, exactly know what Congress is going to do over the next, the next, uh, the next couple of years. Uh, the node performance will be up by, you know, uh, something like a factor of five. Uh, uh, we're hoping to see uh, some increase in node memory bandwidth. You're, you're probably going to, you know, the, the higher number would be if, if there's some, some scratch pad or some, some, some uh, memory that's on package. Uh, we're going to see a lot more concurrency. In terms of system size, we'll see you know, some increase. It's not going to be a huge increase in the number of nodes. The main thing you're going to see is a lot more node concurrency. Uh, increasing the node interconnect bandwidth in this time, time frame is really a, cha is a, is a, is a challenge. Uh, uh, so it may actually be Nurse 9 where you see really a big, big boost in this, but, but we are working to see if we can improve that. So, uh, uh, so we'll need to use a number of different approaches to pr begin preparing the, the user community. Uh, we're having, uh, with the vendor and the technology provider, we'll be working with NERSC and ACES. To, uh, uh, we'll be uh, doing developer workshops, uh, early test beds, uh, an early test bed for users. We'll be engaging with the, uh, the application teams. Um, we want to partner and with and leverage existing efforts. There's certainly a lot going on with the community, and so it's not like NERSC is going to do this all by ourselves. So we need to coordinate with, with Oak Ridge and Argonne and the other centers. Uh, and we really need to do widespread training. As I said, um, um, you know, we have lots of users, and so to manage this transition for everyone, we really need to do things that are scalable. So we want to host workshops, online training, uh, create easy to follow online documentation to, to help users as much as possible. So this is just uh, one example. We've looked at in our application readiness efforts to date. Uh, we've also looked at, at GPUs and, uh, and other technologies, but this is just one particular code looking at uh, Nice Corner. Uh, uh, so actually it's two different codes. There's the Berkeley GW code and an atmospheric model. And, and what you can see I guess the, the takeaways from this is, so it's comparing in blue performance on Sandy Bridge and in red uh, performance on Knight's Corner. And it's looking at, like, the original, you, you 
refactor the, the, the loops, uh, add OpenMP, add vectorization. Ultimately, all of those are necessary to, to get good performance. Uh, but what you are seeing in all cases is that the blue line, as you do this work, becomes, uh, goes down as well. And so, so one benefit of, of getting ready for these next generation architectures is that actually your code will run better on the Xeon, uh, on Xeon clusters and Xeon workstations as well. So, so, uh, um, uh, so that's, that's a, that's, I think that's a very important uh, part of this as well. So we spend a lot of time talking with you all, partly through uh, requirements reviews, partly through uh, uh, meetings like this. Uh, to figure out what we need to be deploying in the future, what direction we need to be heading. So we do requirements with six program offices. So uh, uh, within the Office of Science, we try to do the reviews every three, three years. So we're almost through our uh, second, set of, uh, second set of reviews. So we pick a target, so like we'd say 2017. So we go and have a discussion with the program managers and the scientists. We try to get a representative set of the users. So typically we want people at the meeting who represent more than 50% of the usage within that, within that program office. Uh, we try to really have a discussion about science goals and representative use cases. Uh, oftentimes the scientists aren't really that interested in flops and bytes and bandwidth and all these things. So really, there's certain science problems that they need to solve in a certain time frame, And then we work with them to go backwards based on those, those science that, uh, requirements to, to estimate what the, what the computational requirements are. And then we do rescale the estimates to account for users not at the meeting. Uh, we aggregate results across the six program offices. And then we try to validate uh, through in-depth collaborations, things like uh, the, this meeting here and the, the user surveys. This does tend to underestimate the need because you're, you know, sometimes you can anticipate who might be a future user, but oftentimes you don't know who's going to be really a new user in, in five years. Um, uh, so, so this does t try to uh, underestimate things. But this just shows uh, in the black line is kind of the, tr the overall trend, and in red are the actual NERSC hours delivered. So you see a slight dip, uh, which is when Franklin was turned off. And now that we're deploying uh, Edison, you're seeing that, that green triangle, that's, uh, that's Hopper plus Edison. Uh, and you can see that, that since we went with a, a Xeon architecture, we didn't deploy GPUs, we were actually falling significantly below the, the trend line. The, the black arrows are these aggregate needs from these uh, user requirements workshops, and those are actually much higher than the trend line even. And so you can see that not only we're, you know, we're way short of the user requirements, but we're also falling below the, the trend line. And that's why we need to, to transition to a more energy efficient architecture. And so, so with NERSC 8, you see a range that's mainly driven by budget, but, but we need, it'll uh, help us begin to get closer to that, uh, that trend line as well. The other thing is uh, you, can, you can kind of project out from these uh, uh, requirements reviews, and, and you can see that, that uh, they're increasing very rapidly. And, and in the 2018 timeframe, the aggregate needs of our users will actually be uh, in the exascale regime. So, so, uh, so you hear lots of talk about exascale, but, but just looking at what's going on and trying to project with our users, it's pretty clear that to do the science that they, they need to do in 2018, 2019, really requires uh, uh, exascale computing. So this just shows, I asked, uh, we always show these things on log plots, but if you show it on a linear plot, you actually see uh, it really is a big gap between, uh, between uh, uh, kind of what we're looking at and the, the user requirements are, uh, or needs are much, much higher. And we also ask people about, uh, about storage, uh, networking, other things. And so, so the, the needs that we're requiring uh, that we're getting from these uh, requirements reviews also point to big shortfalls in, in things like archival storage as far as what the, what the users need. One of the things we've been looking at is, uh, is uh, the data traffic uh, into and out of NERSC. So in red is the daily high for the week, and in blue is the high. Uh, and you can see that that's also increasing exponentially. Uh, every day we're getting more and more traffic, data traffic, 
there were some major improvements in TCP auto-tuning uh, that, that brought it down, but then we had, uh, we've had a number of collaborations with different facilities with high energy physics and that, that had created kind of a step function back up to this, uh, uh, up to this trend line. And then if we just extrapolate this out, what we see is that we expect our first petabyte day in 2020. And so that's a huge amount of data that, that we would be transferring in just, just one day. This just shows there's lots of different, different plots like this we could show, but this is just one weekend last year. And you see uh, data traffic. They were doing a particular uh, study down at Slack. And you could just see the, the, the data traffic, very high speed data traffic to, to NERSC for the entire weekend. And so this often happens is they're, you're running some, some uh, big experiment at some, uh, some facility and they're really inundated with data. And they've got to take that data somewhere to analyze and, and try to get scientific understanding. And so we see these huge uh, inflows of data traffic uh, depending on what's going on at the different uh, uh, DOE experimental facilities. And so, so uh, I guess I can't, won't be able to say this a lot longer, but, but I, you know, this was one of the things that surprised me, so I'll have to find something else that surprises me. But, <laughs> but one of the things that surprised me is that, that uh, NERSC users actually import more data than they export, which is, you know, you think about yourself as a supercomputing center. What you think of is that people will do, do simulations and take data away. And so they are taking lots of data away. We're ex exporting... And this, these numbers are actually much higher now. We need to update them because they're, they're typically above a pet, petabyte a month, um, uh, especially since we've gone to 100 gigabit networking. Uh, but we were, uh, in blue is how much data we were exporting, and in red is how much we're importing. And so you can see a lot of data is coming in. And so you can say, well, where's that coming from? To be honest, some of that does come from the other centers because they have inside al allocations that end, and suddenly all that data ends up coming to NERSC. But a lot of that data is also experimental data coming from, from uh, 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 cosmology or, or high energy physics uh, or from, uh, for, from Dea Bay or uh, uh, we get lots of traffic from JGI. So lots of different facilities are always uh, transferring data from, from ALS, the, the advanced light source here from Slack. And so, so you'd expect that, well, with all this data coming here, that people must be doing something with it, right? And, and uh, we have lots of examples of, uh, of uh, scientific discovery that's kind of the traditional uses of HPC, but we're also seeing that data analysis is playing a key role in scientific discovery. So a lot of the highlights that we're having here at NERSC, uh, 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 we're seeing more and more examples where it's extreme data science uh, or related to extreme data science. So uh, there's the uh, uh, Palomar transient factory. So, so data is automatically transferred from the observatory uh, to NERSC. There are uh, algorithms that are run uh, overnight. Uh, there's an example of the, one of the, the uh, a very early uh, discovery of uh, type 1A supernova in the last 40 years. So that was discovered overnight. And then instantly, the, the scientists called collaborators around the world and really telescopes from around the world were refocused on the, on the, uh, on the, the, the same supernova so they could, they could follow its birth. Uh, so that's resulted in lots of refereed publications and nature articles and, and, uh, and it really makes heavy use of the science uh, gateway nodes uh, to share the data among the collaboration as well. That's something we're seeing as well as a growing need is, is uh, you have all this data and then you have all the, the, the people who want to access it as well. Uh, uh, solving the puzzle of the neutrino with with the day of bay there were lots of there were detectors and they they transferred data to to, to NERSC and analyzed it uh, and they were able to m measure the uh, theta one three neutrino uh, parameter which is the last and most elusive piece of a long-standing puzzle of why neutrinos appear to vanish as they travel and so so that really used a, uh, high performance computing for simulation and analysis the the data came into archival storage and used the data transfer capabilities, including ESNet, and it used the, the, uh, the NERSC Global File System and then Science Gateways for distributing the results. And this was one of Science Magazine's top 10 2012 breakthroughs. Uh, the Planck mission, there was a lot of write-up. It was one of Physics World's top 10 breakthroughs of 2013. But a European Space Agency satellite mission to measure the temperature and 
uh, polarization of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, realizing the full scientific uh, potential of this required really large computational resources. So all the data, NERSC was the primary computing site for, for Planck, and all that data was transferred here and analyzed. And, and we have a materials project where uh, this was uh, 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 recently cover, a cover on Scientific American, but, but we have uh, 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 lots of users, lots of companies that are using it. But, but we're, what we're providing is the infrastructure uh, uh, so that, that people can screen materials using computational um, uh, uh, That's much cheaper than making them in a lab. We've had more than 35,000 inorganic materials calculated in two years, and those are coupled with online design and search, uh, search tools. So I could give you a very long uh, talk on this. Uh, uh, so if you're interested sometime, we can talk about it. You know, there's lots of discussion about exascale. Uh, I was, as Richard mentioned, I was on the exascale initiative steering committee for DOE, and we developed a roadmap for DOE and identified some of the key challenges uh, you know, there's lots of discussion of big data. Uh, you know, granted, for, for NERSC, it's, uh, it's, it's scientific data, but there's lots of discussion of big data. And sometimes these things are viewed as being orthogonal. But they're really, they really face the same computing t challenges. So in terms of things like, like energy efficiency, uh, uh, in terms of a uh, lot more concurrency, uh, your inability to move data at the same rate as you can... You can uh, 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 perform the computations. All those are, those are really common challenges between uh, big data and concurrency, and like I said, big data and exascale. And that's something, something like I said, I would be happy to talk with you more about. Uh, the other thing is that this data de deluge at experimental facilities, and, and we're improving networking, so, so w we see this as an accelerating trend uh, towards data-intensive computing. So if we just look at what's going on in the facilities, we're seeing huge increases in terms of the detectors that people are deploying are improving at much faster. We think of things like uh, memory uh, improving very, very quickly, but, but the improvement in instruments is actually uh, much greater. Uh, and so that's helping create this uh, data deluge. Uh, this is kind of leveled off some, but the cost per genome had been going down pretty dramatically. And when we look at things like uh, the advanced light source and and, and, and at Slack, uh, the, the data rate is, has been growing and growing. And, and, you know, we can see that in the future, uh, you know, we're going to be at, at, at terabit per second type data rates. And, and we're seeing that data sets are going to be growing to hundreds of petabytes. And so, um, so this is something that, that we do expect to play a bigger and bigger role. Um, we're already seeing the impact of that at NERSC, but we're going to see a bigger and bigger uh, impact in the future. So our, our strategy has really been, you know, we have to continue providing great operational, uh, uh, you know, we have to do great at operations because really anything we do has to be built on that base. Uh, but, but on top of our operational base, um, we, we see that we need to de uh, deploy uh, exascale, usable exascale computing and storage uh, systems for our users. Uh, just as you look at the demand for computing within the Office of Science, it's really, it's really uh, amazing to see those, uh, uh, those curves. We need to start transitioning the, the codes, and for NERSC this is a big challenge because we can't spend three FTEs per code help, helping them transition to many core architectures. Uh, and we do think we have a, a, a critical role in terms of influencing the computer industry uh, to ensure that future systems really meet the mission needs of the Office of Science, but really meet the needs of our broad base of users. And that's something of very much of interest to the computer companies as well. They don't want to deploy systems just for one application. It's hard enough to get them to pay attention to high-performance computing, much less saying, oh, well, you should only focus on these three or four applications. So, so we've been uh, working very closely with, there's a, a fast-forward effort within the Department of Energy, which is funding some of the, the, the chip and memory and storage companies. Uh, uh, we recently launched Design Forward, which is uh, focused on interconnects, and so we're trying to play a very active role in, in, in trying to make sure that the broad needs of all of you are represented as the, the, the companies think about their future products. And then, then finally, 
uh, we really want to increase the productivity, usability, and impact of DOE's user facilities by providing comprehensive data systems and services. And so, so we see, see both of these as complementary initiatives, but they're both absolutely critical for, uh, for the, the future of NERSC uh, and the ten year, next 10 years of computing here. So that was, that was uh, with that, I'll uh, be happy to take any questions. So uh, the study that you made of the uh, night, uh, Knight's Corner uh, didn't seem to be that convincing that this is the way to go if you look at the graphs there. Uh, yeah, so, so I think with all of these, you know, we made the, the decision to wait. Our, our preference would be to uh, have a self-hosted architecture. So we think that uh, if, if you avoid, right now people are trying to, connect accelerators through a PCI connection. And that really, uh, you're really being limited in many cases by, by the, the very poor bandwidth that you have. And so our, our, our hope with NERSCate would be for it to be a, a, a self-hosted architecture. And that, that, should, that should help quite a bit, to be, but to be frank, uh, there is a significant challenge. Um, so so uh, getting good performance on these uh, next generation systems uh, isn't always going to be uh, easy. Some people are already working on it. Uh, so we've actually done some, uh, uh, some detailed analysis of which codes are more ready, which ones need more help, and we're trying to, to target the, the ones that we need help. And we also want to coordinate with Oak Ridge and Argon. We don't want to be working on the, the same set of codes. But then again, we also need to make sure that, that, that uh, the transition that we're doing uh, is, is somehow related to the transition that they're doing. So there is some need for uh, coordination among the centers as well. So Bill, you had a, you'd raise your hand? Oh, you? Okay. Hi, I, I, you uh, emphasize data as being the critical thing for NERSC, and so I wondered how you thought about traditional nurse simulations or traditional HBC as being more geared towards predictive models and and where do you see that going into the future? So right. Yeah, so, so, uh, so that's why we really have uh, these two strategic objectives, these two uh, what we've been calling initiatives. Uh, they're, they're very uh, interrelated, but, you know, I think that the top one is really aimed at our more of our traditional work, workflow, uh, which a lot of it is, is uh, uh, sol solving these scientific problems, these uh, PDEs or, or, uh, or, or other things. Uh, uh, and, and the bottom is, is at, uh, related to data. So, so we think that both are, both are important for our future. Uh, whether you can deploy a single system that meets both sets of needs, that's, uh, that's something that we're exploring. So there are different options for that because right now, if you look at it, a lot of times people deploy different systems to, uh, for the, the, the second set of problems as opposed to the first set of problems. Now, when we've done surveys as to why that is, there are some architectural differences. You know, for instance, people will say that for these data-intensive problems, you really need uh, 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 much faster I.O. And so with NurseGate, we're looking at... Uh, uh, potentially deploying a burst buffer, which would, which would be a layer of NVRAM, which would dramatically increase the amount of I/O capability that a user could see. Uh, but a lot of the, the the things that they point to are actually software related. So I would say that that uh, two thirds or three quarters of the the issues as to why people are deploying different systems here have to do with more software as opposed to architectural differences. And so. So we are looking at, on our large systems, can we provide the same set of uh, software services that people need? Thank you. Thanks. What are the future plans for the non-flagship machines like PDSF, GenePool, Mendel? So, uh, so our collaboration with uh, JGI is, is critical for NERSC. 
Uh, it's something very strategic. I think it's helped us uh, pioneer a lot of things uh, and understand these data workflows much better. Uh, they're also, you know, uh, uh, here at the lab, so there's, you know, it's a, it's a very strategic partnership. Uh, we are working with JGI to see if parts of their workflow can, can run on Edison and Hopper. They'd love to be able to use some of their, uh, their ERCAP allocation for some of their, their computing. Right now, Genepool is very much tailored to their workflow, right? And, and so, so making that transition is not, uh, not, uh, 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 not particularly easy, but it's something that we're going to be exploring with, uh, with JGI. We will be moving Genepool uh, into CRT. So I would expect us to have, uh, uh, you know, the, the collaboration with, with, Gene, with uh, JGI to continue for a long period of time. Uh, the collaboration with PDSF and the high energy physics community is even longer. And so I would, so we're certainly expecting to move so we'll certainly be moving Mendel. We'll certainly be, uh, uh, you know, our expectation would be that PDSF is, you know, will continue in, in a, uh, you know, that will be a longer, you know, longer term. But we are looking at can we, can we move some of that workflow to NurseGate. And so some of the things that we're looking at is potentially having a data partition on NurseGate. And that's something we can talk with you. We'll certainly be able to talk with you uh, more about in a few months. Uh, and it would be certainly useful to understand how useful that would be for some of these uh, for some of these problems. But the idea would be to have, uh, you know, you could have a more uh, uh, x86 part based partition that had more memory uh, that also had access to the burst buffer uh, that potentially had a different software stack. And so, could you meet some of these needs? Uh, it would certainly be much more cost effective if you can meet some of those the needs with the same technology as opposed to uh, deploying different systems for everyone. So, but, but that's something we're going to be looking at. So there's currently a demand for infrastructure to host uh, human related data, particularly with the Brain Initiative and many people here in LBL actually participating on in those initiatives that relate to human data. Is there, uh, what's the likelihood that NERSC uh, will come to host human-related data and be HIPAA compliant and, and, and so on? Uh, yeah, so it depends on the, 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 uh, the, the types of data. That's, that's something we're, we're looking at if it's, uh, if it's HIPAA compliant or, you know, if, if it requires, there's some data that uh, isn't associated with a, uh, a particular person, right? Uh, and so that, that doesn't ha have the same security issues as if it's tied to a, uh, a particular person, right? If it, so, so, so we are looking at different, could we provide uh, different levels of security for different types of data? It's, kind of, it's a very much of a challenge in our environment because we try to, I think one of the things that users really like about NERSC is that we are very open, right? Uh, uh, so, so, but... But we are looking to move in that, that direction, but I think we have to do it in a way that uh, doesn't dis disrupt what we, what we normally do. I think if, our, if we made all our users get crypto cards or something, I don't think that they'd be, uh, uh, they'd be very happy. I don't think we'd be very happy either. Uh, so, so, so I think those are some of the trade-offs that we have to, to look at. I think we have done s some work with the human uh, Brain folks, and I don't know. Shane, do, are you? Uh, We've done some work, but it has been pretty much training, like you said. Usually we're trying to work right now with data that's still uncommon. Yeah. But that's always an issue when you start moving into data. You know, if, if it's data from Slack, they're probably not that, 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 they're, they, uh, Experimental data has value for a long period of time. Um, you could argue what the value of computational data is over time, but experimental data typically becomes more valuable with time because you can't go take a snapshot of the, of, uh, of the night sky or you can't go rerun an accelerator s experiment. Uh, so once you have that data, you really want to hold on to it for a long period of time. So they have lots of issues with resilience and longevity. Uh, if you add privacy to it, you know, so a lot of the data we deal with doesn't have this privacy 
issue, but, but, but that's something we have to, we have to look at. Good. Thank you, Sadeep. Okay, thanks.